So our last presentation for the day is Dr. Clark. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Shannon Clark is the Stewardship <laughs> and Development Manager for the Upper Mountain Great Plain Region for Envu? Envu. Envu. Looks like Vu. Oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon received her PhD in weed science from Colorado State University. She continued her research there as a postdoc focusing on evaluating herbicides with emphasis on invasive species management on rangeland and ROWs, right of ways, right of ways, I should know that, and right of ways <laughs> before starting with NVIEW. Shannon continues to collaborate with Carver State University Weed Science as a faculty affiliate. So welcome, Shannon. Great, thanks. Well, I'm definitely going to change it up, and I am going to be talking about annuals, so the last talk was kind of a great segue into talking more about these annual species, but I promise I have that invasive perennial component in here too, but um, I'm hoping to just stress the importance of um, looking out for these annuals coming into the Great Plains ecoregion because it's a, a new issue we're now dealing with. Um, so, um, and they, ha they have a lot of the same effects that we talk about with smooth brome and Kentucky bluegrass in terms of impacts to pollinators, biodiversity, um, declines in forage quality and quantity. So, so invasive winter annual grasses. So unlike the perennials we've been talking about, um, Obviously they're annuals. Um, they typically germinate in the fall, but they can germinate in the spring really anytime the growing conditions are right when we get some cool wet weather followed by a warm up. Um, they do start growing, they overwinter in a semi dormant state, so they don't go quite fully dormant. And then in the spring, they get started really early. And so they're able to deplete that uh, moisture and nutrients that our perennials would take advantage of. Um, and then they senesce by um, late spring, early summer. Uh, when our perennials are usually just getting started um, and create this kind of fine fuel layer on the uh, surface of the soil. Um, they're also prolific seed producers since they are annuals. And we'll be talking a lot about why that's important in just a second. Um, but just to show the spread a little bit, um, oh, the pointer is working for me, so that's good. <laughs> um, so this is cheatgrass. That's pr you probably all have heard of cheatgrass. It's the most common winter annual that we deal with. Um, what do you see you get into this Great Plains region, it's not as prevalent in, as in the arid Western US. And so um, not as much of a problem um, here that we've noticed, although as the climate gets warmer, we might see that become more of a problem. Um, but what I really wanted to focus on today and what I'll be talking mostly about um, is Ventanata. And so Ventanata is um, a winter annual that just, it it has a little bit different pattern of invasion than cheatgrass and that it spreads very rapidly in this uh, circled area. Um, so that was its first kind of report to this US or yeah, USDA plants that are ed maps that it was in the Great Plains eco region. Um, and so that was 2016 Sheridan County, Wyoming, where they found actually both Medusa had invented out of the same year. Since then, they've found thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of Ventanata, and it's rapidly spreading. So you pull up ed maps, and that's what you get. But this is actually the map created by the University of Wyoming for known infestations of Ventanata. And you'll see um, this is, it was just found in South Dakota last year. Um, here's Montana, Eastern Montana. Um, there's Wyoming. And so not reported in North Dakota yet, but on all the borders, um, we're seeing rapid expansion into the Great Plains ecoregion. So this um, species, um, the reason we're so concerned with it is it, it provides basically no livestock or wildlife forage value. There's a high silica content. They won't graze it. So unlike cheatgrass that you can graze off early in the year, you, you can't with um, Ventanata. Um, you also see it uh, invading um, wetter sites, um, non-disturbed sites, unlike cheatgrass, which really likes to get its foothold in disturbed areas or maybe in a drought year, Ventanata will come into those wet areas, smooth brome areas, so it can actually outcompete smooth brome. Uh, and so uh, it, it's been extremely worrisome in the fact that they're, uh, they've been, the University of Wyoming has partnered with a lot of other people I'll show at the end to really take management um, actions against this species. So just an example of um, cheatgrass choking out perennials like what it can do to a system. Um, and then there's Ventanata, so similar things and just that it impacts that biodiversity, um, your pollinator plants, wildlife habitat, things like that. Um, so I just wanted to show this because I think this is important and critical to why I wanted to give this talk here um, because the fact that the Great Plains don't have um, a lot of Ventanata yet. And so, you know, in the past with cheatgrass, we've been a lot of in this reactive 
management system. Um, but where, you know, should we work? Um, we really should be working in those proactive systems where as soon as the invasion gets started, we manage. Um, and so we can save those desirable native species because um, it's really hard to take the landscape back once you get to this. Um, so thinking about managing the seed bank is really important as we switch from these perennial species, um, which I'll include also in the management. I promise I'm going to talk about those smooth broom and bluegrass, but uh, these annual grasses, you really have to think in terms of managing the seed bank. Um, so every year you get the seed rain, it's that deposit into the soil seed bank. Um, they withdraw that in the form of germination. A lot, most of the seed does germinate the following year, but that seed bank can persist longer than that. Um, which there was some great work done at Colorado State University showing that um, just with a long-term study utilizing glyphosate to burn down any current growing plants. Um, so what they did was they utilized one to five years of glyphosate applications, just manage any growing plants to evaluate the seed bank. Um, so when they managed for one year, by year two, um, you see that cheatgrass, this was one cheatgrass, but the cheatgrass biomass um, was right back to where you started on year two. Um, if you had two, this is two years of management with glyphosate, um, then you stop managing, you start getting that infestation coming back in. Um, three years of glyphosate applications or management. Um, if you stop managing, you still had viable seed in that seed bank. So it was really four and five years of management where you stopped seeing that seed um, or stop seeing the cheatgrass reemerge from the seed bank. Um, they collected soil cores at this point in time took them back to the greenhouse, grew them up. And so you really see that impact from the four and five years of management, um, not having a lot of viable seed left. And in fact, some of these are perennial species um, that grew up in, in these pots. Um, so really our long-term treatment success is gonna be dependent on managing the seed bank of these species, um, not just the actively growing plant. Um, so what tools are we, uh, do we currently have um, and people have tried grazing and mowing and fire. So a lot of the same tools we're talking about with these perennial invasive grasses. Um, but in the past, we haven't had a lot of great options for long-term control. Uh, but I started working on a project in 2016. So that's what I'm going to focus the rest of this presentation on um, is kind of the results we're seeing from this long-term project we've been following uh, with the use of a newer herbicide um, called endazoflam. Um, it's sold in their brand brand names, Esplanade or Rejuvra. Rejuvra is the range and pasture product. It's a cellulose biosynthesis inhibitor, which is a new mode of action to rangeland. Um, so it's a uh, pre-emergent herbicide, um, pre-germination herbicide really, but as you um, spray it, the herbicide really stays in the top part of the soil profile. Um, it's worked into the soil solution with moisture and it controls these annual species as they land their seed on the soil surface um, and try to germinate. Um, but at the same time, our perennial species, which um, we're dealing mostly with perennials in these systems, um, are protected with their root zone below that active herbicide layer. Um, it's a three and a half to seven ounce rate, uh, use rate, five ounces is the average and the max rate for graze sites. Uh, so I'm just going to get into a bunch of the research projects we've been doing to kind of lead you through the um, showing the impacts these annual grasses are having on these ecosystems by what we've seen with the improvements with treatment. Um, so this is a long term Ventanata research project that was done in Sheridan County um, in partnership with uh, Dr. Brian Mueller there. And these were just three by nine meter herbicide trial size plots um, done with a CO2 backpack sprayer. There was several applications. Um, of endazoflam and then in combo with both um, amazopic or rimsulfuron and they were applied in June, July or August. So kind of an early pre, a pre-emergent or a late pre-emergent timing. And so what we see is um, these are all of our treatment combinations. Um, they all did include endazoflam and then we have our non-treated here. This is Ventanata cover um, on the x-axis and then we have our different timings here with our treatments. Um, so we have really low vent and not a cover um, within all of our treatments one year after. Um, we flipped it two years after it actually gets better. This is because the herbicide is a longer lasting herbicide in the soil. It works its way in with moisture. So we actually often see improvements that second year after treatment. Um, the third year, notice that this y-axis changed with the, or the x-axis changed with the numbers here. Um, There's very low vent and not a cover that year because we were in severe drought but you'll see we have no Ventanata cover within the treatments still. 
And then we flipped a perennial grass cover. Um, so again, we have cover on the x-axis axis here, and you'll see um, good results in terms of increases in perennial grass cover. And that's one year after treatment, um, two years after treatment, still similar results. Three years after we were in a drought, so we don't quite see those persisting. Um, and I didn't have the data yet um, from 2022 to show, um, but we'd expect that to bounce back up once we got some moisture. This was a really following a really, really severe drought year. Um, but to just show those increases throughout the year um, and maintaining them um, is, is really positive. Um, then I wanted to show some more stuff that the University of Wyoming, they took this, this study further um, to look at the forage quality and quantity. Um, and so we look at the changes in forage quality by removing that annual grass, that ventanata from the system. Um, th what they did was they looked at over the months of the growing season, um, and you see higher crude protein content pretty much besides in the early growing season, you see um, higher crude protein um, through the rest of the growing season and higher TDN. Um, this doesn't take into account that livestock won't even graze ventanata anyway, so it doesn't even matter what the, the quality is, but um, you're, you're opening up a higher quality forage um, for those animals. Um, we also see improved forage quantity uh, with the removal of ventanata. Um, and so this is just showing the annual grass biomass. And so the, the brown lines are the treatment. So basically there's no annual grass biomass um, within there. Um, this is just through the season. So you kind of see that decline as it senesces and dies off in the fall. Um, but with perennial grass biomass, you see you know, similar amounts within the treated and non-treated early in the season, but then you see that huge spike increase in perennial grass biomass um, with the treatment where you've removed that ventanata. It's not competing any longer with that perennial grass. Um, so that's just an introduction into showing some of um, what, uh, what we're seeing on results on these species. So now I'm going to show some um, impacts to the native species I've, we've been doing a huge project following these um, on the front range of Colorado. Uh, so we started a sampling project across the Western US in our operational treatments to kind of sample what were the changes to the ecosystem with these annual grass treatments. Um, and so that was the objective of, of this study. And so we came up with the sampling design or kind of in partnership with the University of Nebraska, they, they use some of this um, where we do our plots have a center point, and then we run three transects off that center point, and we do quadrats. And within those quadrats, we collect, um, we have a little screw tip here on our quadrat. We collect line point intercept information. Um, we record uh, percent frequency of occurrence. Um, we also take dry weight rank, which is a way to visually estimate the biomass, the top contributors of biomass um, within the quadrat. Um, so I'm going to show, show a few results. So I promised I would show um, some of these invasive perennial grasses. And so here, these next few sites are example of um, some interesting treatment combinations where we saw really good impacts to both the annual grass and the exotic perennial grass. Um, so it's kind of a little hard to tell in this picture, but this is all smooth brome. This is the non-treated site, and there is cheatgrass within this as well. Um, so the treatment was put out in the fall of 2021, and there was both endazoflam and amazepic combined in this treatment. And if you notice over here, the treated at 10 months after, um, you don't see any smooth brome. Well, it's kind of hard to tell, but this is actually all Western wheatgrass if you see all the green. And so um, amazepic, smooth brome is really sensitive to amazepic, um, but we're excited to see that result um, with that Western actually filling in the place of the smooth brome once we um, knocked it back with the amazepic. Um, so this is our frequency of occurrence results from the site. And so um, what you see, what I tried to do is kind of make it a little bit easier to get through all these species, but anything with the blue arrow was an increase of that species in abundance on the, the treated site. And anything with a yellow bar or an orange bar is a increase in occurrence on the non-treated site. Um, and so we just, we use binomial confidence intervals um, <laughs> to calculate these. So if the confidence interval overlaps, there's no significant difference. So what we saw was that this site, um, it had been in smooth brome for a long time. It wasn't a very diverse site, um, but we do see increases in Western wheatgrass, um, a huge increase in Western wheatgrass um, and Louisiana vetch. Um, but what you see is the smooth brome occurrence over here 
about 60%, over 60% frequency of occurrence in the non-treated, um, where almost no smooth brome found in the treated site. Um, you also see everything that in increased within the non-treated were all um, exotic species. So like cheatgrass here, Japanese brome, uh, lissum. Um, and so, so we see really positive results in switching that ecosystem from an invasive ecosystem to back to more native desirable species. Just showing some of the dry weight rank data, um, and we see that um, treatment switching that site to more of a western wheatgrass dominated site from a smooth brome and cheatgrass dominated site. So when we switch over to, um, this is uh, getting more into the southern Rockies eco region, um, but it's right on the fringe of the high plains, so, um, so you get a lot of similar species here. Uh, this is in the front range of Colorado and Boulder County, um, but just an example. So this treatment was actually done in April of 2021, and it had endazoflam with rim sulfuron um, to knock back um, Canada bluegrass. So I know the focus has been on Kentucky bluegrass, but they have Canada bluegrass there. They do have some Kentucky bluegrass too that shows up at this site, um, but those species are very similar in terms of how they react to herbicide treatments. Um, so I still think it's really applicable to show the information from it. Um, but you can just see here the switch. This is all Canada bluegrass within here that you're seeing. And then you can see that switch here with the herbicide treatment. Um, so there's a lot of species. This is a really, really diverse site. Um, and the diversity just increased once we treated it. These aren't even all the species we found. I only did things that had higher than a 10% frequency of occurrence um, because really the statistics are getting um, iffy if you, uh, once you get lower occurrence. But um, what we see is these blue dots over here, just a much higher frequency of most of the native species within that treatment, um, which is really positive too, that we didn't impact those native species when we were trying to take out that Canada bluegrass and the cheatgrass that was there. Um, so all those, those increases in the blue bars, then you see the increases in the orange bars here. You can see most of these are non-native, or these are exotic species. So Canada bluegrass, cheatgrass, um, Dalmatian toad flax, Western salsify, all increased in the non-treated site. Um, then we flip over to another, this is the same, um, at the same location in Lyons, um, but this treatment was actually put out in March of 2018. I wanted to show this because this is data collected four years after, because the last one that we just looked at was collected just over a year later. So you might ask, well, what's the long-term benefit? Um, so I wanted to show that. Um, so again, we see that re great response with all those native species increasing within our treatment zone. Um, but I wanted to point out here, Canada bluegrass, we do see a little bit of that Canada bluegrass coming back in, but it's still really reduced four years after treatment um, compared to the non-treated, which has almost 100% occurrence of Canada bluegrass. Um, so really positive results there at four years after treatment. So um, it, that's a long lasting treatment with just one application. Um, and then again, you see the cheatgrass, Dalmatian, toad flax, western salsify, all increased in that non-treated site. Um, so then I'm just going to quickly go through some additional monitoring we've done for biodiversity impacts to um, from these annual grasses. And this is just to drive the point home of ventanadas on the spread. And even though this is cheatgrass research, ventanada has the same, if not worse, impacts. So it's really why we need to be watching for it. Um, and manage it when it does come in to these Great Plain, Plains areas. Um, but this was 14 research locations across Boulder County again. Um, these sites are all considered globally rare and irreplaceable. They have a really high diversity of native species, a lot of rare species and species of concern. Um, so the data collection included doing 15 foot belt transects to just monitor presence and absence of species for each site. Each site had a paired treated and non-treated. Um, they were all treated with endazoflam at that seven ounce rate. Um, and then they did some georeferencing of um, rare species within some of the sites. And then some, um, some of the species, they recorded flower number per plant um, to compare differences in flower number. Um, so just real quick over here, this is the mean species diversity per site from 2019 to 2021. Um, and each year you can see the treated sites, you get more species coming in and more diversity. Um, compared to the check sites, which pre stay pretty static throughout those years. Um, 
This is showing increase in flower number per plant. And so what we did was we took 10 species of a plant on both the treated and non-treated area, counted the number of flowers and got a mean number. And so just a few are represented over here, but we evaluated 34 species. Um, and all of them had higher numbers of flower per plant in the treated side compared to the non-treated. And why is that? Just because the cheatgrass is using so much of that moisture resource um, that, you know, the, the reproduction part of the plant is the first thing that it shuts down when it's under drought conditions and cheatgrass is akin to being in constant state of drought. Um, this is just showing rare concern species, their list that they had for their area of rare and concerned species. Um, but this is just the number of sites they found, the percentage of sites they were finding rare concern species on, um, increasing throughout the years with those treatments, obviously staying pretty static in the, the check. Um, this is, I think, some really cool data because you can visualize. Um, these are some rare or concerned plant species for Boulder County um, that they list as rare or concerned. Uh, and then so they started tracking them. So this is 2020 after a treatment. Um, they're tracking and they're seeing some of those rare concern species come back, flip to 2021, which was actually a pretty dry year. Um, you have a few of those rare species showing up in the check, but um, you can see they counted uh, over a thousand individual rare plants in the treatment area. Um, and this is the last thing I'm going to finish up on. So we took six of these sites where we were tracking these diversity measurements on and we tracked pollinator information because we wanted to see, you know, we're seeing more of these flowery forbs come back in. What is that doing to the pollinators? Um, so we set up transects. We did timed pollinator observations, looked at floral resources um, it, throughout the growing season. Um, so basically what we saw is this is by week and these are the number of flowering forbs detected um, on average in the sites. Um, you see each week um, several more flowering forb species detected in the treated sites, which is the blue dots, compared to the check sites. Um, this is just an overall average richness throughout, combined throughout the season. Um, the mean richness was higher in the treated sites. Um, just an example of, you can see um, the impact to some of these species with that cheatgrass present. Um, we looked at pollinator groups in the observation. So this would be the mean number of pollinators or uh, these are all arthropods, but um, the pollinator groups are highlighted here in this red box. Um, but the mean number uh, found per transect, um, you see significant increases in several of those pollinator groups um, with this study. So um, this isn't indicating that the pollinators increased, but that they're using the treated site over the non-treated site. Um, so they're detected more on that treated site because there are more resources. And then same with floral visitor richness. So this is just the number of different pollinators or arthropods that were found um, throughout, the uh, throughout this assessment. So mid season and late season, we have almost a two times increase in richness in the different pollinator species that we were able to detect on those transects. So kind of just to wrap it up, um, I wanted to show this landscape scale picture. Um, this is from Sheridan County, Wyoming. Um, because they're really proactive in managing the Spentanata right now. Um, but they are achieving landscape scale restoration um, through these partnerships, which I have a slide on. Um, they have like the Northeast Wyoming Invasive Grass Working Group. They have um, now a group called Imagine. Um, and they're just, they're partnering to bring money to landowners. Um, they work with NRCS to, to use like equip money and, and different grant funding. So they're able to make these treatments um, on a landscape scale, um, instead of just individuals trying to manage it on their own, so that an impact can actually be made and seen across the landscape. So um, just really cool example of a partnership, but there's several of these going on right now um, in the Western states, and especially with um, Bentonata Medusa Head, because um, they are so aggressive and, and provide no forage quality. So um, so it's been great working with these groups and I just wanted to give an example of how these impacts are being, or these management tactics are being used on the landscape. Um, so with that, I got through a lot of data and I know it's the end of the day, but if you have any questions, I will be happy to take them. <laughs>